Hey everyone, welcome back to another evening live stream. Today I'd like to start with Deutsche Bank's piece on Tesla. Uh, it's going to be worth diving into this a little bit. So this is the piece right here. Uh, and I just started going through uh, some of this and figured we can go through some more of this together here. Uh, so Deutsche Bank is now expecting flat volume in 2024 and limited free cash flow. This free cash flow is actually one of the biggest uh, areas of contention for Tesla that you want to pay attention to. You do not want that to go negative. They've got maybe three to four billion. We ran these numbers yesterday in free cash. That's very different from what a lot of uh, Tesla bulls say. They just literally read cash off the balance sheet, don't look at the payables, and they assume that Tesla has over $20 billion in free cash. It's not true. Uh, so limited free cash flow is a potential risk factor as it could lead the company to have to raise some money. Doesn't necessarily mean the stock's going to go down, but it's something to watch. And it's also interesting to note that uh, they argue yesterday is moderately negative reaction to the bad Q1 basically is reflecting investors' increased understanding of the near-term challenges for the company. This is a nice way of saying that, hey, you know, pe people are aware that, yeah, the next quarters might be bad uh, or Q1 will be bad. The question is, how long are people going to be accepting of Tesla having bad quarters? If Tesla has four quarters uh, uh, that, that are bad in a row, and that comes around the same time that you have, let's say, a market correction, then you could potentially suffer more pain. This is something that I always like to consider as well. Uh, think about just where we sort of are in uh, the, the sort of Nike swoosh recovery of stocks right now. Uh, we're somewhere around here in that volatile QQQ recovery where we're at all-time new highs. And we're nowhere near a sort of, you know, we had this dip last summer. We're not in a dip. So the question is, if we get a dip over here, do we get to sort of more peak pain for some of the companies that really are showing signs of struggle in the good time? In other words, the good time could be helping prop up some of what we're seeing at Tesla now. Uh, in terms of the near-term price action. But anyway, they uh, lower the uh, revenue projections for Q1 to adjust for this. They're also moving their gross margin to just 13.5% to reflect a lot lower volume. That's because you're still keeping the factories going, but you're not receiving the revenue, right? You're producing the cars, so you're spending the money to make the cars, you're paying for the employees, but you're not actually recognizing all of that revenue. Looking at 2024, they're cutting their full year volume to 1.84, basically flat, and that's down from about 1.9. That puts them at about 2% growth for the year. Uh, they do still bake in an 8.6% price decline year over year for uh, how much they think that uh, uh, you could end up seeing some of these vehicles uh, still get their prices cut. They're also lowering their 2025 earnings per share to just $2.15, which is exceptionally low, uh, and uh, leading to uh, $1.80 of earnings uh, per share for 2024. That's not great, uh, given that if you go to just $1.80 at, uh, say, 160 for the stock, divided by a buck 80, that means you're trading for about 94 times on a PE ratio right now for Tesla with those sort of low earnings. Uh, and even if you factor in a recovery to 20% growth, you're still looking at over a four peg uh, with that sort of PE ratio at 20% growth. The issue is we're not even at 20% growth right now. Uh, so definitely seeing some reductions here in EPS. It's gonna be a while, I think, before we get sort of a meaningful uh, uh, you, you know, upgrade to EPS because we really have to prove that full self-driving can go somewhere. And I do mention here that they reiterate their buy, but they lower their price target to $189 based on 42 times a 2027 EPS. So in other words, right there. So this is a Deutsche Bank piece on it. Again, expecting that flattish volume. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they see uh, weak Model Y demand in the US, which is not great. Uh, and, and then, of course, you have the competition in China with uh, some time before we actually get to a next-gen vehicle, especially since we're still expanding the Cybertruck. So something to consider is, uh, you know, I was looking at just what some other 
Tesla bulls were saying, uh, and I want to touch on that. Let me quickly just do a quick summary here. So 2020, their um, price target is 189 based on uh, 2027 uh, estimates. They are estimating uh, buck 80 for 2024 EPS. And then what do we have again? I just want to write that down. I think that was t uh, buck or two dollars fifteen cents for next year. Yeah, two fifteen. Estimating $2.15 for 2025 EPS and then uh, estimating 1.84 million vehicles in 2024, 2% growth. So at, at 170, we're at about a 90, what we say, 4 PE ratio. Use 20% growth and you're at uh, over a 4 peg. Okay. So those are some figures from Deutsche Bank, of course. Uh, you know, seeing a drop from three dollars to a buck eighty is is pretty big on EPS. Not great. That gross margin dropping, gross margin down to thirteen point eight percent for the year, also a hit. So anyway, uh, I was looking at what some folks were saying, some other bulls were trying to say, and everybody really seems to be married to this idea that. Oh, well, you know, BYD sales were down 43% in the quarter. So this is an industry-wide issue. And, like, I, I'm inclined to believe and, and agree with data. I like data. I agree with data. But uh, the data doesn't fully agree with that. And I think, unfortunately, some folks are taking a very one-sided opinion on this. So take a look at this on screen here. Uh, this is eHack. Sorry, I got the little editor open for it. So vehicle deliveries in Q1... BYD sales were up 13.4% year over year. Yes, quarterly sales fell 43% because they reduced prices so much in the fourth quarter that this massive pull forward, but they still ended up growing year over year. Tesla year over year was negative. Nissan, a negative 8.5%. Nissan was up 7.2%. Toyota was up 16%. Honda was up 17.3%. Kia was up 2.5%. GM to retail customers was up 6%. They had some declines in um, fleet, which led them down, I think, like somewhere around, um, let me grab these Ford numbers as well. It led them down, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, down about 1.6%, 1.5%, uh, 1 there it is. And then let's throw the Ford numbers here as well. So I'll throw these in really quick here. So this is Ford, uh, Ford sales up 8 point, or 6.8% year over year with uh, Q1 EV sales up 86%, right? So when we're looking at sort of the, the broader market in terms of how some of these numbers are changing, they're, they're not so ideal. Uh, the Tesla numbers definitely don't look like an industry-wide phenomenon. So I think it's a little difficult for Elon Musk to slam somebody like Ross saying, oh, well, BYD's down 40%. The reality is most of the industry is actually growing, including BYD, on a year-over-year -year basis. And if you consider this, the BYD is now introducing or planning to introduce a truck competitor. Now, of course, this is Chinese competition, and that is where we're seeing some sales issues. But you are getting now a truck competitor as well. Elon is also uh, trying to sort of kind of keep hype going by mentioning and resurfacing this idea that Tesla's ready to license FSD software to other automakers. But you have to remember, he's made that claim two times before. Uh, as early as July of 2023, he's sort of been pitching this idea. And the reality is that was nine months ago, nearly nine months ago, and, and nobody's been going for it yet. And the Cybertruck still doesn't even have FSD. Now, that may be because of steer-by-wire, which now Ford is getting into steer-by-wire. But it is interesting that, you know, we do kind of keep hearing the same sort of promises, but we're not just, we're not seeing those yet. So those are some things to keep in mind. Something else that was fascinating was that uh, gold broke $2,300, and Bloomberg found this to be very unusual because usually gold rallies when uh, the 10-year real yield is very low. So that's when you're uh, you know, subtracting uh, the 10-year yield and then subtracting inflation from it, and you're getting a very low number. Today, that real yield is somewhere around 2%, and so you can see it's at the higher end of this, and usually you don't get gold rallying in these environments. So the fact that gold is rallying towards this low on real yields right now is a little weird. It could be because gold is trying to price in Fed rate cuts and a looser uh, monetary policy, or it could be because gold is trying to price in some form of negative sentiment coming and some form of very dangerous issue coming from markets. Who knows? Uh, found that interesting. 
Uh, OPEC obviously uh, is uh, keeping their uh, production cuts. That's contributing to oil being nearly $90 a barrel on an international basis. And then it does also look like uh, Trump originally hired the people he's suing for his SPAC, basically just to set up the business. And they even had this services agreement where they had really restrictive expense reimbursements, or maybe you could say normal, but like it was very clearly spelled out. Don't spend more than 150 night on a hotel. Don't spend more than on an economy flight or a super saver flight. Uh, and now all of a sudden, those individuals are claiming the right to about 8.6% of DJT. That's what Donald Trump is suing for right now. Uh, keep in mind that, that, that Trump roughly right now, uh, Trump owns about 53% of a DJT at the moment. Obviously, he's under lockups for another like five and a half months, so it's gonna be a while before he can actually get get his hands on uh, some of those Dalahalas. But we already know that. So, uh, okay, so that hits some of the Tesla news of the day. It hits um, uh, oil and gold. Something else that's uh, coming up is that there's a lot of talk about uh, Elon Musk uh, having to pay a lot more because of competition from OpenAI. Uh, one of the issues that you have here is we made this video on the main channel. We talked about the wage price spiral. I highly encourage you to watch it because it's not just AI, but it's fast food. And what we're seeing is actual reports now where wages are starting to rise again. And so there's a, a, a real concern that uh, if we do end up setting off a wage price spiral, we could end up with longer term issues with, um, with inflation. So watch that video on the main channel. We also have uh, the... A strategic petroleum reserve down to just 17 days of supply. Elon Musk did say that, uh, sorry, not Elon Musk, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Joe Biden did say we were going to refill the strategic uh, petroleum reserve, but uh, now with prices so high, they are delaying that refill. Uh, there's also talk now about Apple exploring the development of personal robots after killing their sort of EV project. So now they're looking at robots that can follow people around uh, around their home as well as some form of tabletop device that use robotics to adjust the, the script. I, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, it seems like Apple is kind of uh, a little bit. It feels like Apple's a little all over the place right now. But then again, they've got a lot of employees. They spend a lot of money on research. We actually did a breakdown on this on eHack. And Apple, yeah, I thought this was very interesting. Apple has about 12,000 engineers, designers, and marketers, not counting the store and support staff. They spent $7.69 billion on research and development. If you divide by 12,000, that works out about to $641,000 per employee or about $10,000 per working day per employee on research. And, uh, you know, we're, we're all kind of like, Where's the product? <laughs> now, I did make a video on the main channel yesterday, which I thought was very good. Uh, it, it's a little speculative uh, based on Apple's research paper into artificial intelligence, but it really shows you what they're trying to accomplish and the direction they're trying to go with, uh, with artificial intelligence. And a lot of the research paper actually sounds very logical in terms of how you might actually be able to implement uh, these, uh, these features into future services. So I found that uh, fascinating. So uh, if you haven't seen that yet, that's on the main channel too. Okay, what else do we have? Uh, then, uh, oh, we had this, this pretty large Wall Street Journal election poll that came out, suggested that in swing states, Biden is falling behind in six out of seven swing states if the election were held today. Biden leads in Wisconsin, but he's losing the other six swing states, losing by five points in Arizona, one point in uh, Georgia, three points Michigan, six points North Carolina, Four points Nevada, three points Pennsylvania. Keep in mind that Biden won Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan in 2020. And so it's somewhat of an issue now that uh, Biden is losing those swing states. Biden does lead on abortion, but Trump right now leads on mental fitness, physical fitness, the economy, inflation, and immigration. Those are some pretty big deals. So uh, pay attention to that. You've also got uh, some tension in the Middle East uh, expanding now with further settlements by Israelis into the West Bank, something that uh, I, like outpost settlements are illegal per uh, Israel and international law, but settlements are not. And so what's happening is these outposts are being built and then they're connected to settlements to try to sort of build them illegally and then make them legal. So it's sort of like annexing more land. A uh, little bit of an issue creating more tension with the Palestinians. Uh, we talked about Jerome Powell a little bit on the main channel, so we don't have to go through that too much. We did talk about 
the uh, um, ADP report already. And uh, Bostic this morning uh, did suggest that he still only sees one interest rate cut. I do think that the market is substantially overpricing the chances of a rate cut in, uh, um, what's it called, uh, June. Uh, right now, our pricing for June sits at roughly 62.9% that uh, we're going to get our first rate cut then. I'm not convinced by that. I, I, I think that's, uh, that's a little unlikely at the moment, but then again, you know, who knows? We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, otherwise, we have, uh, you know, some crazy w videos came out of uh, Taiwan, if you haven't seen them yet, in terms of the, uh, uh, the earthquake and some live video, or well, not live video, but recorded video of the actual earthquake happening. Uh, really remarkable. I mean, some of these, you know, let me see if I can uh, pull one up here. There was one in Taiwan where you could actually see the um, these boulders coming down and uh, hitting cars. And it's just remarkable that uh, not more people died. Uh, and uh, it just, just sort of makes you wonder, you know, what, what do you do in a situation like this? Take a look at this on screen here and you can kind of see it here. So right now, no earthquake yet. The earthquake begins as this car in front here turns in here to this corner and the car stops presumably because they start seeing some of the earth uh, moving ahead of them. They start seeing this bubble of dust come up uh, and then you'll start seeing them actually back up. It's probably good that they do end up backing up because watch what ends up coming down from the right side here. Take a look at this. See that dust right there? Car decides, you know what? It's time to back up. This is a little dangerous. Let's go back up a little bit. And uh, watch what comes down here on the right side, because it gets a little, uh, <laughs> yeah, look at that boulder just coming smashing out. Look at this, boom, right into the back of that car there. Lucky they didn't back up more. That could have killed somebody pretty easily. And look at this. This car is literally backing up, escaping the falling boulder. There's another one that would have killed someone as well. It's absolutely insane. So, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty wild uh, right there. Quick question, did you play RuneScape? Oh, you should know I played RuneScape. Come on, I got my coffee cup here. Mm. So, yeah, anyway. Uh, uh, pretty, pretty wild. So, yeah, definitely lots, uh, lots of RuneScape. Okay, so what else? Somebody here is talking about affidavits, uh, questioning election integrity. Remember that an affidavit is really just somebody saying something. It's somebody's opinion, right? Summer, Summer's progressing. She's, uh, she's got a little work to do. She uh, had a little bit of a slow week. Could it be that Tesla's price to license FST is too expensive? Yeah, it depends. You know, maybe maybe Elon's trying to sell it for $12,000 per, let's say, Ford vehicle that goes to install it. But remember that, you know, uh, Ford, their CEO has gotten convinced that they can make a lot of money off software. Remember when we played that audio? Anyway, uh, I, I would expect uh, that they, uh, yeah, sorry, I did write that Kia was down 2.5%, not up. Yeah, you're right about that. Uh, but still, I mean, 2.5%, it's, it's a drop in the bucket. Tesla's clearly the worst out of everything on that list, right? So, uh, but anyway, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of companies are very bullish on being able to get their own software to realize those margin increases, right? I think you got to get out of California. You will become much more bullish. And I actually I don't think there's anything wrong with California in terms of like, you know, living in California. There are plenty of issues from a political standpoint. I mean, you just have to look at Los Angeles or San Francisco or some of these really politically broken areas. But uh, no, California is a great state. It's beautiful. People are great. Uh, and, and yeah, don't worry. There's plenty. Almost everybody can agree the politics are broken. It's just, uh, it's... I don't know why why people haven't voted for something better yet. I, I think it's a lack of alternatives, honestly. Somebody somebody good's actually got to run. But anyway, uh, so let's see here. Kevin, time for an annual check on T Doc. They're in the dumps. Yeah, I remember T Doc being in the dumps for a while, uh, and uh, quite frankly, when they started taking those massive goodwill write downs, I got a little nervous that the company was a little kooky dooky. Uh, so, okay, let's see. Somebody says, I heard the Newsom recall entered signature phase. See that? I love. That's, I just, I find that so entertaining. Uh, all right, let's drop off of that. Let's go over here and let's go to TDoc. Teladoc. Teladoc's down $14. Wow. Does Ka is Kathy still investing in TDoc? 
Let's go to Kathy's arc. I know she was really interested in Teladoc there for a while. Uh, it's their 18th position. Yeah, they do have it, but it's relatively small out of all... Uh, well, that's out of Arc K. What if I go to Combined? If I go to Combined, T-Doc uh, sits at, yeah, position 17. Okay, so it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty low over there. So... Uh, what else do we have here? So, looking at some other comments here. <laughs> That's why you're running for mayor of San Francisco. There you go. No, we've got... Uh, that was a good video. I, I actually think that's the perfect plan for San Francisco. But, uh, oh well. So... <laughs> oh, I see some of these comments are funny. Yeah, summer hopefully is home within the next uh, two weeks. I'm, I'm hopeful, fingers crossed, but... I, uh, our, our little baby Summer, she, um, she's, uh, you know, two steps forward, one step back, but mostly getting better. And then there's actually somebody here, Summer H, I have to do taxes, so behind, stepfather died yesterday, mom can't take care of herself, sister can't drive, so I'm losing my mind. My goodness, Summer, this is not a year for summers. I'm so sorry to hear that, that's terrible. So, uh, okay, well, so what else do we have here? Nothing compares to Tesla. I mean, I agree. I, I wouldn't want to own another car, but let's just put it this way. If I needed a family car for my family, we couldn't buy a Tesla. You know, what we would really need is, uh, we would really need like a Sprinter style vehicle. Uh, and so hopefully that happens at some point in the future. No, I actually don't think I'm a mega bear. I see Cooking Phil here says Kevin is a mega bear now. See, I don't agree with that. I actually think I'm just realistic about the data. And I look, I go, all right, you know, these are going to create problems. And we combine the problems at Tesla in the short term with Fed policy over the next year, along with the potential for a correction setting up. You know, you're, you're in a nasty period of time uh, for Tesla. It's just going to be very hard. You know, could the thing slowly trickle up? Of course, but uh, it would make it very sensitive to a very rapid pullback before you could even react. So it, that, that does make me a little bit concerning, mostly because the fundamentals aren't, like, strong enough to withstand that kind of correction. Like, think about this, okay? Like, the way I look at this is, this is how Tesla is performing since, where's October? November 1st. November 1st is when the pain stopped, right? Okay, so let's zoom in here. So here, let's just go to the day chart because it'll be a little easier to see. So broader market pain stopped November 1st. Okay, right here, right there. Broader market pain stopped. And so we ended at a close of $203. We're down like 15%. Well, what is that? Two, let's see, 168 divided by 203. Uh, we're down 17%. When the entire market has rallied, Tesla's down 17%. And that's in an exciting time, in a FOMO time. Like, we're in a FOMO time, and it's down 17%. Imagine when we get into fear time. That's the concerning part. Like, it's not, oh yeah, let's try to go, you know, from greedy time to greedy time and just play price swings there. It's... You know, do you sell in a greedy time to try to rebuy in a fear time? Potentially, it's strategic for tax loss harvesting purposes. But, uh, uh, you know, and then you look and you go, well, what are the long uh, or, or the near-term positive catalysts, right? And and uh, that potentially weighs you to, uh, uh, to make a move. Uh, that doesn't mean you're out forever. It doesn't make you a mega bear. It just says, hey, short term's going to suck. So, uh, anyway. People are complaining about uh, Kevin changing his opinions after seeing new data or clowns. Well, thank you for saying that. Uh, so, let's see here. What else? Uh, a lot of folks talking about mail imbalance. Okay. So, let's see here. Oh, I'm actually surprised. Arc K is down 5% year to date. I didn't know that. I thought they were up year to date. Oh, that is interesting. Uh, oh, well. Kevin says the Jews are doing something sneaky to take over more land. Isn't he of German descendants? See, that has nothing to do uh, with Israel. <laughs> like, literally. Like, where I was born literally has nothing to do with that. Uh, I got a summary of Tom Nash's take. The problem is, Tom Nash did the same thing that all the Tesla bulls are doing. In fact, uh, you know, I like Tom, but I'm a little disappointed because I feel like 
it was sort of like a summary of all the positive sentiment on Twitter because that's what people like to hear. You know, I, I, it was the, hey, well, BYD sales are down 40%. Well, that's what we just opened up in this video is we actually looked at all companies. Why were BYD sales down? Uh, what about their sales year over year? And how did that compare to Tesla? How are other companies actually doing? We're actually going deeper into the data. Uh, but that's not, that's not like shareable. That doesn't get subscribers. That's not fun. You know, Pe people don't want to hear negative things about Tesla. It's just sad. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, uh, what's funny is this morning, it's funny QE Infinity, you mentioned uh, luck in coffee. This morning, we actually did an analysis. Uh, well, yeah, I got to write that down in our Discord. I always like to put a little summary of what we analyzed. But this morning, we were analyzing Starbucks in our course member live stream. We did a uh, deep dive, and so let me write that down. We did uh, Dave and Buster's and s -Buck, Starbucks, mostly because their stock's been somewhat bleeding out. Uh, and we're, we realized Starbucks might not actually do well in China as we had thought. Much more detail in that in, in the course live, and I don't have exposure to Starbucks. I've been waiting them for, for them to get under 80 as a potential China play, but I don't even know if they're going to be a China play. So I thought that was really interesting, and, and Luckin came up quite a bit this morning. Uh, what will it take for China Tesla to get back on growth time frame? Thoughts? Uh, probably, honestly, a year. Thoughts on young man looking up to the Tate brothers? Well, it depends. For what? <laughs> for women advice? Bad. <laughs> for for motivation? Probably, uh, probably good. Uh, you know, so you gotta have to parse that out a little bit. But anyway, what was, I did see Dell today. Yeah, it's almost like people moved their money from Intel to Dell. It was crazy. Um, but anyway, uh, what will it take for Tesla to get back on growth? You kind of have to bottom out, <coughs> excuse me, you have to bottom out this year. And then uh, once you bottom out, that's when, you know, you could really start growing again. And then you could start pricing Tesla as a growth stock again. Do you think Neuralink, satellites, robots, and solar roof is priced into Tesla? Okay, well, first of all, Neuralink is not Tesla. Neuralink is a separate company. So no, Neuralink is not and won't be priced into Tesla. Satellites are SpaceX, which are not uh, Tesla. So no, satellites aren't going to get priced into Tesla. Solar roofs are ridiculously expensive, hard to manufacture, and are competing against plummeting solar prices. So no, solar roofs aren't going to be priced into Tesla anytime soon. Robots is fantastic hopium that is probably a 10 year out reality if we're lucky. And uh, wow, gosh, you spammed that like five times. Why'd you have to spam it? I read your first time you wrote it and then you paste it like five more times. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, now I feel bad I answered your question if I noticed you spammed it. But anyway, uh, yeah, no, I mean, this is, it's, uh, how, how do you price in robots? What price? What margin? Who's gonna buy it? How many are they gonna buy? How much competition is there going to be at the time? How do you price that in? Well, just, I think it's gonna be good. It doesn't work. <laughs> Strategic funds believe Tesla bottoms at 100. Uh, that might, might make sense. You know, that is where you had a previous bottom. Uh, that absolutely might make sense. But yeah, you gotta get those uh, year over year comps in for Tesla. And you really got to beat those uh, negative uh, uh, negatives. Is Myra solar? No, end phase micro inverters with Q cells. Uh, what do you think about Nike? No, I don't know. Uh, I haven't done a dive into Nike in a while. As a follow up, maybe we'll do that on another course member live. As I follow up on Tesla, do you believe in the robo taxi story? Not soon. No. Uh, there are substantially too many edge cases for robo taxis at this point. And. Um, in the long term, do I believe in the robo taxi story? Yes, but it's you know it feels just as untangible as it was seven years ago. You know we've been talking about robo taxis for Tesla for seven years, uh, and and it's still not here. So uh, it doesn't really make me optimistic on like the next two or certainly like the next one, uh, <laughs> right? Anyway, uh, okay, good. So uh, let me see if there's any other last minute story here to cover. I think we've done pretty good. Uh, let's see here. Biden outraged about what happened in Israel. Well, as he should be. I, I think everybody's relatively outraged there. That doesn't mean Israel bad. It just means Israel made a real big stamp or a problem. 
Uh, oh wow, the patient with the transplanted pig kidney left the hospital. That's also, I think it was like 60% human. But anyway. Uh, Alright, what else? Canada, or uh, China and US talks continue, that's fine. Kellyanne Conway says Democrats are losing minority voters. That is true, we are seeing uh, more of the sort of Hispanic and black community uh, no longer support Biden. Now, that's now, you know, a lot can change between now and the election. But that is possible. That's interesting. After weeks of uncertainty, Trump posted a $175 million bond in New York in the New York fraud case Monday with the help of a little known California billionaire, Don Henke. <laughs> Henke's Knight special, Specialty Insurance Company underwrote Trump's bond. Okay. Uh, the billionaire known as the subprime auto king in Los Angeles made his fortune financing high interest auto loans for customers with poor credit. He's since expanded into finance, tech, insurance, blah, blah, blah. Wow. That's crazy. Uh, wow. Very interesting. Mr. Hanky. Uh, Don Hanky. How old is this guy? Don Hanky. Oh, he's 80. Uh, wow. He's called an American loan shark. Look at this guy's profile on Wiki, at least. Don Hankey is an American loan shark, founder of the Hankey Group, which makes most of its income from car loans. Is the Hankey Group public? The Hankey Group. Oh, they got fantastic reviews. Not. <laughs> uh, they, they must be a private group. But anyway, uh, which makes most of its income from car loans. He has been the repo man and the king of the subprime auto loan. Car dealer, started as a car dealer. Ordered to pay $44 million for illegal debt collection practices. That doesn't surprise me if you're doing subprimes. Oh, wow. Westlake Financial was found guilty of... Who's Westlake Financial? Uh, its main business being Westlake Financial Services. Oh, his father's business. Stealing $9 million from elderly victims in a Ponzi scheme. Gosh, this guy's great. <laughs> Jeez, Lord. Uh, largest shareholder of Axos Financial. Okay. He's financed stuff for Trump before. Married with four children, lives in Malibu. Wow. Okay. Very interesting. And Wikipedia lies. I mean, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree uh, that that's possible. Uh, very interesting. Who who is Don Hay? I mean, this is the Washington Post, or sorry, USA Today, is what we clicked on. Yeah, all right. Anyway, so uh, let's see what else. Trump loses presidential immunity delay. Oh right, he was trying to basically delay the hush money trial uh, to wait for the immunity uh, trial to go through. Obviously, uh, most judges are going to say to that, hey, like, why don't we try you in the meantime while your immunity case goes through? And then if the immunity case goes through, we can have that conversation at that point. There was also talk about Google charging for artificial intelligence powered searches. That'd be a pretty big change, mostly because now you would be charging people to use Google, which is interesting. I mean, uh, you know, open AI charges, obviously. So uh, it's possible. You did have this news about Tesla scouting for uh, like an India location, maybe two to three billion dollar plant. I don't think they have the money to do this, <clears throat> mostly because they've sort of halted their Mexico groundbreaking because of CapEx concerns. And so it seems to me like a little bit more of sort of like charading for shareholders. Uh, again, if they were breaking ground in Mexico, I would believe it. But without us breaking ground in Mexico, I'm skeptical. Again, I don't want to come across as a negative. It's just, just am. Uh, so what happened to QQQ after hours? Big I saw that. Yeah, uh, after hours were actually pretty optimistic. Uh, you know, usually you don't really 
uh, you know, paying attention to the off after hours is is like comedy because, you know, you could be up this much in after hours and then all of a sudden you see uh, the next morning it's it's the complete opposite and you're down. So I generally don't put much reliance on it. But futures are positive right now, so who knows? Maybe maybe that is. Uh, we'll we'll know in the morning. But yeah, I I generally don't get too excited about the pre or post. Like let's see what happens in the um, uh, in the actual uh, market tomorrow. Shall see, because uh, there wasn't like one particular set of news or anything. Phil Strezza says, has Househack been able to raise funds at the two dollar price points? Yes. I don't know exactly how much we've raised at the moment, but yes. Uh, there are new investors who are very interested in house hack and they see the vision, they see the future, they see that $2 is still a long-term steal. Obviously, that's my opinion. That's likely their opinion. Uh, I can't guarantee that or, you know, make promises. Investing is always risky, but I mean, that's my goal too. My goal too is that, you know, a $2 stock price becomes a $20 stock or something in the long term. Uh, again, I can have goals and visions and, and, and those could differ from reality, but yes, that um, people are investing. It's very exciting. And uh, we're, we're still basically three months away from the deadline, all of April, all of May, and all of June. So we're essentially three months away from the end of the fundraise. I, I really don't want to ever fundraise again. Like when it is, it is so exhausting, uh, just because it's it, like you're, you're working with, you're touching with each investor, you're verifying wires, you're dealing with confirmations, all this. And it's fine, we do it all, but it, like all of that accounting work takes away from actually being able to focus on the core business. And so we, we don't wanna you know spend all of that money and time doing that all the time. Uh, so, uh, and you know, those are salaries anyway for folks, so it's fine, like they're, they're at the company anyway, so it's not like it's a m big marginal difference. But uh, I, I still think the resources could be better used. So that's just something what I think of when I think of fundraising. Uh, and ideally we won't have to after we uh, launch our mini funds. So that'll be really fun. So a lot of a uh, lot of really cool, cool future, exciting things. I mean, I'm so excited because I just I look outside the stock market. I just I go, wow, we've got you know, obviously providing value on YouTube. That's just just sort of the core of who I am and what I do, and I think that's really fun. But then we've got House Hack. We got the House Hack mini funds and the 1031 into mini funds. People are emailing us about. We've got uh, the event coming up in June. Then we've got the fintech startup. There's a lot. That's really fun. Makes for long days, but that's okay. There's always something to catch up on or do, which, but I kind of like that. So let's see what else we have. So S&P is going to 6K, whether the Fed cuts rates or not. I mean, I think in the longer term, you're probably not wrong. See, uh, interest rate cuts, again, they don't matter for these bigger AI plays. The question is, are you going to have sort of an AI cooling at some point? And this sort of like FOMO reset where people are like, wait a minute. You know, it's not going to take much of a catalyst, I think, to drive a lot of selling pressure really rapidly. I don't know what that would be or why that would happen, though. Which real estate stock would be a winner in the long run? Zillow, Redfin, or Opendoor? <laughs> well, I put Opendoor at the bottom of the list. I think Opendoor is pretty bad at what they do. I think they're a bad business model, and I think they do bad work. And that's just based on my opinion of going to their property. So that's not a fact. It's just that's my opinion. And um, you, you go to open door properties. I've seen dead rats in them. Uh, it's cheesy work. It's low quality uh, oversight and, and it's concerning. Again, it's my opinion. So they would be last on my list. Uh, but yeah, open door and Zillow, you know, you really need rates to come down again so you can get volumes to come back for real estate agents. That's, uh, that's where you make the money there. Uh, so yeah, closed door, exactly. Uh, what is this? How what? How many small companies has there? Uh, not worth, and so many algorithmic. I'm not sure what you mean, John Calvin. Anyway, uh, uh, let's see here. Have you seen weed stocks lately? Yeah, after Germany pushed uh, weed legalization, you saw a massive surge in weed stocks. Somewhat similar to what you saw back when Biden was elected, there was a big belief that if Biden was elected, you would end up seeing weed stocks skyrocket. And that just wasn't true because it just wasn't a priority. So if you look over here, you get into uh, the uh, election era over here, 
you you did start once you got to inauguration time you started to see this run up of weed stocks and once you and you really had like euphoria i mean you went to, from a four dollar stock to a 67 dollar stock there for a moment so you had this insane memeing and euphoria over uh marijuana stocks and nothing ended up happening in the u.s so you ended up bleeding down to you know two dollars and eighty cents three bucks it's pretty wild pretty wild so uh yeah lang sauce make sure to watch the end of that video <laughs> uh but anyway so um look i'm i'm pretty uh pretty excited overall i think the u.s economy is in a great place i do think the stock market is poised for a near-term correction and that'll be very painful for certain specific stocks mostly because i think we need to unprice our rate cuts and we'll start probably seeing some more bear steepening like we've been seeing let me see how the twos tens have been doing that ISM data to this morning with weaker prices was good. And you do have jobs and CPI coming up. So if these are all good, there might not be a reason to see some pain come out. But all it would take would be a, like, if you get a good jobs and CPI report, you keep the train going. You get a bad jobs and CPI report, both of which come out over the next week, you could have a catalyst turn down very, very quickly. Uh, and I'm still worried about what's going on with wages. Watch the main channel if you haven't seen that. And uh, you'll see a little bit of my thought on wages. So now I think that does it for tonight. So let's go ahead and push the button. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, real estate broker, and becoming a stock broker, this video is neither personalized financial advice nor real estate advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purpose of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services which we may benefit from. I personally operate and actively manage ETF and hold long positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuers other than House Act, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. So something else I'm just watching is I like watching BTC overnight, and it is really, really capping out. Uh, it's having trouble staying above this trend line as you can see once it went below it it's been stuck below it and now we're sort of creating a little bit of a ceiling here so we're gonna watch this very closely because i do think it's also a red flag for risk assets assets i mean think about what you've got going on i'm gonna quickly write this down well, to the benefit of those of you who stay past the disclaimer <clears throat> btc topping out right think about what you have for a moment Gold skyrocketing for gold. This is considered a skyrocket. Oil topping out. Yields rising. Well, I shouldn't say oil's topping out. It's more like rising. Uh, BTC topping out. Qs are topping out. Uh, QQQs topping out. Gold skyrocketing. Oil rising. Yields rising. And... Uh, you know, I, I don't think it takes much, much of a sneeze to kind of uh, push some things uh, um, over the edge. So uh, it puts, yeah, I like this phrase, we're on thin ice. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, and to be clear, oil, I, I didn't mean to say oil topping, it's rising. Just like uh, gold and yields. So what's topping out is Bitcoin and the Qs. I mean, again, you can see that here. This is a topping out of Bitcoin. Okay, this, I mean, could you have a breakout on the halving? Maybe, maybe, but that, that's a topping out pattern to me. Here are the cues. You're getting stuck. I mean, that's the weak chart. You've been here now for one, two, three, four, five, six weeks. Look at the day chart on the cues. It looks like a topping out pattern to me. We'll see. We'll see. Anyway, folks, 